An eight-year-old wakes up from a two-week coma and tells his mom some stunning news. I said, Landon, do you know where your dad is at? And he told me, yes, I know where he's at. I saw him in heaven. He'll share what else he saw in heaven. Plus, guest Mark Moore shares his story of a second chance at life after surviving a stroke. All on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, good morning and welcome to the show. A recent Barna study found that most Americans still believe in miracles, with over a quarter of those surveyed believing that miraculous healing isn't just something they say may be true, it's something they've actually experienced firsthand. We want to show you the miraculous story of Landon Whitley. Landon was just eight years old when he was driving home from church with his family, and their car was crushed at an intersection by an ambulance. Landon's dad died at the scene, and so did Landon. Take a look. I didn't see what he was yelling at. I didn't see the ambulance coming, but I remembered him yelling. That was the last thing I heard from him. On a Sunday morning in 1997, Julie Kemp, her husband Andy, and their eight-year-old son Landon were driving home from church when an ambulance returning to its station broadsided their car in an intersection. Andy died instantly. Rescuers stabilized Julie, but did not realize there was a third passenger in the car. They couldn't see his body because of the damage that was done to the driver's side of the car, and Landon was sitting behind his dad. And when they saw Landon's shoe, it took a deeper search for his body. When they pulled Landon out, um, uh, from the back of the car. He was not breathing, and they all started working on him right away to bring him back. Landon was resuscitated and life flighted to Carolina's medical center. He died two more times that day, and both times he was brought back to life. Doctors didn't give Julie much hope for his survival. They told me that if he lived, which did not look good, but that if he lived, that he would be like an eight-year-old baby, that um, he would not know how to walk or talk or to eat. I was so desperate that that was okay. I would take that just to have him. He was all that I had. At her husband's funeral, Julie remembers feeling abandoned by God. I was very disappointed, heartbroken. And while I'm sitting at the funeral, I'm fussing at God. I don't understand um, why this happened. I don't understand um, why He didn't send angels to protect us. But in the very next breath, I'm praying as hard to Him as I've ever prayed in my life for Landon to live. Landon had suffered massive head trauma during the accident and remained in a coma. He's hooked up to all kinds of machines to keep him alive, and there are no signs. There's nothing good or bad. They see nothing happening. I kept praying that he would open his eyes. After two weeks in a coma, Landon opened his eyes. To everyone's amazement, he had no brain damage. But in the midst of her joy, Julie knew she had to tell Landon about his father. He had scars on his face and his head was just full of hurt. And I didn't want to hurt him anymore. So I asked Landon, I said, Landon, do you know where your dad is at? And he told me, yes, I know where he's at. I saw him in heaven. Landon is now grown, but still clearly remembers his amazing experiences in heaven. I remember being able to see my dad and his friend, Olin Palmer, who had passed away less than a month before he did, also in a car accident, and Olin's son, Neil Palmer, who had died on a four-wheeler years before. Never one of us said a word to each other, but we were just all standing there. He looked over to me and says, oh, mom, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I saw your other two kids. And I just looked at him because um, I, I wasn't sure what he was talking about, but um, I had two miscarriages before Landon was born. We had never shared that with Landon. He did not know that um, we had lost two children before him. I knew that they were my siblings, even though 
No one had ever told me about them. Just being in heaven, I guess you know, you know your own or you know who everyone is. He says each time he died, he had a different experience in heaven. During the third time, he says he met Jesus and was given a mission. It was almost as if like um, a preview of a movie to where you only get to see certain bits and pieces of things. Jesus came to me and told me that I have to go back to earth and be a good Christian and tell others about him. Today, through Grief Share, Landon and Julie use their story to help others who are struggling with loss and in need of hope. I didn't understand in 1997, you know, why God didn't send an angel, but I know that there were angels there, and I know that um, we were protected, and we are living out what His plan is for us. Instead of staying mad at Him, I was able to use the story to help others not to give up and to um, keep their faith on their grief journey. I just want people to realize that Jesus is real. There is a heaven, there are angels, and um, to follow His Word in the Bible, and life does get better at the end. In her book, Faith Has Its Reasons, Julie says God has used their experience to bring others closer to Him and has brought new blessings to them. It is a huge blessing that I get to watch my child tell others about Jesus. He is always willing to let others know that there is a heaven because he's been there. I know I'm doing it for Jesus. I know that he's real. I know that angels are there. I know that there's a heaven. I'm not doing it for someone who I don't know or I've never seen. I've seen Jesus. I know he's there. He's asked me to do this, and this is what I'm doing. It's quite a story, isn't it? You know, Landon's not just sharing um, some thoughts he has or a personal opinion. He's sharing an experience, something that he's actually gone through, seeing things that most of us don't get to see this side of heaven, but bringing a word of hope to all of us. You know, I'm sure there are many of you that are struggling today in difficult circumstances of one kind or another. And a story like Landon's just affirms that everything God has said is so. You know, he said, I, I wouldn't tell you this. I'm going to my father's house. There are many mansions there for you. I wouldn't tell you this if it wasn't true. And then every once in a while, someone like Landon has a death experience where they actually go and see and are spoken to and, and even commissioned in a sense to go back and to tell. God wants us to have hope. He wants us to believe that what He says is really true. And so often, like Julie said in that story, we don't get to see or to understand on this side of heaven the why behind things that happen. You know, sometimes they can just seem so senseless. And why does this person, you know, be, get spared and this person does not? Why is this person healed and this person is not? You know, these are the places where our faith is put to a test. Will you trust God? Will you trust that He is who He says He is? Will you trust His great love for you? Will you trust the fact that His angels are always walking with you, protecting you? He says He'll never leave us or forsake us. We are not alone. And so today, I just want to encourage you in whatever scenario you find yourself in, that Jesus is who He said He was, that heaven is real, and that the forgiveness of your sins is available just for the asking. That's what we mean when we talk about inviting Jesus into our heart or becoming a believer. It's saying yes to Jesus and all He did that He came to die for your sin and for mine to cover that thing that separates us from God. He paid the price for us so we didn't have to pay the price. And He opened heaven for all eternity to those who love Him and belong to Him. How does that happen? You just submit your life to Him. It's a day-to-day -day submission, but it begins with just a simple prayer. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord, be my Savior, teach me how to live, forgive me. 
listen today, we just want to encourage you to go to the phones and call if you need to talk to someone about something you have a prayer need with. It's 1-800-700-7000. That's toll free. If you've committed your life to Christ and you want to know how do I grow in this, we've got a packet called A New Day. It was put together just for you. We'd love you to have it. It's free. So when you call that 800 number, just say, could I have the New Day packet, please? And we'll send it out to you right away. Andrew. Thank you, Terry. Well, coming up, meet a businessman who suffered two strokes in two days at the age of 46. Mark Moore is going to share about his second chance at life. That's right after this. Mark Moore seemed to have the perfect life, a thriving business, a beautiful family. But after having two strokes, he found himself an invalid with a hole in his head from life-saving surgery, wondering if he would ever walk again. Mark Moore is a nationally recognized businessman and philanthropist. His generosity to hospitals and nonprofits have helped save thousands of lives. But just 10 years ago, Mark had two strokes just days apart. He was only 46 years old and fighting for his life. But Mark says his strokes helped him become the humanitarian he is today. In his book, A Stroke of Faith, he shares how nearly losing his life helped him find his identity. Well, joining us now is Mark Moore. Mark, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Amazing journey, your thanks. story. And I think it all comes together toward the end when you say, I no longer identify myself in what I do, but what God has done for me. But right before your stroke, tell us what you were doing. You were kind of at the pinnacle professionally. Correct. I was, I was a philanthropist. Oh, excuse me. I was an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, spent my life you know, raising capital for the startup companies, taking them public, selling companies and growing them. And that's what I did for about 30 years. Growing up, uh, you know, you, you, a lot of kids in the family, not a lot of money. So you had quite a turnaround here professionally where, where you were at. Um, how did you view God in the process of all that before your strokes? Before the strokes, I really view God as being in control on Sundays. And I tell people, I, I thought Sunday was God's day, and the other six days I was in control. And with the events of 2007, I realized that was not the case. So what happened that year? Um, in 2007, I developed a blood deficiency, and because of that blood deficiency, my blood began to clot. And as you mentioned, Andrew, the Saturday before Mother's Day, I suffered my first stroke. The Monday after Mother's Day, I suffered a second stroke. And due to complications of the second stroke, they had to perform life-saving brain surgery. And after the surgery, I found myself with many deficits. And one would think that wouldn't happen to you, right? You, living, you were living clean. That's correct. You gave God his day on Sunday. That's correct. Living for your family. I was 46, and I, you know, I had none of the symptoms of, um, that you would expect that people would have from, that would suffer a stroke. I, I wasn't diabetic. I didn't have high blood pressure. I didn't have high cholesterol. I exercised and, and I ate healthy. Um, mm -hmm. So I certainly, I was not the type of person you would think would develop a stroke. But what happened was I did develop a blood deficiency and, and because of the blood deficiency, the blood, blood began to clot and that's what caused the two strokes. So you had your first stroke, you, you, you come out of it, then another one and you had quite a surprise when you woke up after your second. That's correct. That, the first stroke was on that Saturday, um, after, the Saturday before Mother's Day. The Monday after Mother's Day, I suffered a second stroke. Complications arose and I had to perform uh, life-saving brain surgery. And when I woke up, I remember waking up one morning and one of those early morning newscasts on, and I heard the newscaster say, and this week it will be Father's Day. And I was stunned. Wait a second. Exactly, because I'm like, whoa, my last recollection was Mother's Day. That's scary. And it was scary. And I waited. I was, matter of fact, to your point, Andrew, I was scared. Nurses came in and out of the room. I didn't say a word because I was scared. And I waited till my wife to show up at 9 o'clock. And when she showed up at 9, she said, hey, you're awake. She goes, what do you remember? And I goes, I remember uh, the day after Mother's Day being told that, that I would be going home on Friday. I go, but I just heard a newscaster say that this weekend will be Father's Day. I go, what happened? And she explained to me that I suffered two strokes and had major brain surgery. And I had a long recovery ahead of me. And in, you're a man who, during your business career, was cashing and writing large checks, right? And right. here you are, after these strokes, having to relearn even just the process of writing and signing a check, tying your shoes? That's correct. Uh, strokes are certainly very challenging and certainly can be debilitating. And in my case, I lost the use of my left side of my body. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't walk. I wasn't able to tie my shoe. I couldn't write checks. I mean, simple things like getting a shower to take a shower was, was a challenge. Um, it takes a long, a, long, a long time to recover. So I suppose at this point you had a shift in your thinking 
I need to give God every day. That's correct. Um, and to your point, people always talk about having an experience with God. And I would say that first day after when my wife told me I'd had two strokes and a long recovery, you know, Andrew, you, you, you can appreciate this. She told me I had these two strokes and, and a long recovery. She goes, but you know what? Because I stay with you every night. I slept in a, in a chair right next to the hospital bed to make sure you was okay. In, no. your book, in your book, you don't talk about them as my strokes. You talk about them as my experience with God. What, that, a, what a perspective. That is correct. And because really the stroke was just what God used to reach me. Um, because, you know, my pastor um, gave a sermon as I was going through my recovery. He talked about sometimes storms in our life ought to lead us someplace. And, that, and that's in my case. The strokes was simply God's way of trying to lead me somewhere, and I just need to listen to him. Did you have periods of anger at God, though? Oh, sure, sure. Um, they talk about, it. fortunately, Andrew, it was early in the process, and they talk about, the medical profession talks about when you have a life-threatening illness, you go through anger and denial and fear, and I went through all of those. And I tell people, when I wasn't angry, I was in, de in denial, and when I was in denial, I was scared, and when I wasn't scared, I was angry. And when I was angry, I was in denial. So you go back and forth. But the good news is what they talk about in the medical profession on the back end, in order to get a full recovery, they talk about getting to the point of acceptance and hope. And Andrew, for me, acceptance really was surrendering. And hope was really turning to my faith. So in order for me to recover, I needed to surrender to God and turn and relinquish his control. And from a practical standpoint, you were really humbled, weren't you? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's humbling um, in a lot of ways. And, and in some ways, you know, you have to accept where you are and yeah. realize, because even when I, I accept the fact that, you know, this is what God, you know, maybe this is where God wanted me to be, I still couldn't quite understand it, because I'm like, well, why me? But Andrew, the real question, why not me, right? You know, why not? My wife told me at one point, Maybe God allowed you to have two strokes so you could show people you could recover. And it was a very telling statement. And I heard that, but I also kept thinking, well, well why would he pick me? And the answer the question, well, why not me? Why not me? I love the line in your book when you say, I was a wealthy man, but now I'm a rich man. What do you mean by that? That's From the business standpoint, oh, I, I had a very successful professional career and was able, and God put me in a position where I was able to, you know, accumulate a lot of a lot of wealth uh, and that's that's wonderful but the fact that man, well, I wasn't rich spiritually and what I realized as I went through this process uh, I attend a church in, in, in uh, Fairfax Station Virginia called Antioch Baptist Church and they talk about we are called to do more than just worship we're called to study his word we're told to good, do good works in his name and we're, and we're told to spread his name to a lost and dying world and to your point Andrew what I realized that I'm called to do more than just worship and that's all I was doing. I was worshiping on Sunday, but I have to go to Bible study. I need to study his word. I need to do good, do good work to his name, and I need to spread his name. And very likely you'd still be living as a, just a Sunday Christian, if not for this experience. Oh, I, there's not a doubt in my mind. If, if I had not had this feeling God's presence in 2007, I would probably still be doing that. Not a doubt in my mind. You've left the corporate world now. Yes, yes. What are you up to? Um, right now, we are basically working on philanthropy. Um, my wife and I created a family foundation, um, trying to give back. We realize we've been blessed, and we try to focus on health care, education, arts and culture, and Christian evangelism. So we're trying to really give back some of the many blessings that God has given us. Yeah. It's an amazing journey you're on. Well, Thanks thank for you. sharing it with oh, us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Appreciate Thanks for the opportunity. It. And if you want to hear more of Mark's story, his book is called A Stroke of Faith, and it's available wherever books are sold. Now let's go over to Terry. Still to come, a family struggles with the realities of war. I was in constant fear for my children's lives. I knew we had to get out of Syria. See how viewers just like you help this mom start over when we come back. Ismail is a young boy who fled the war in Syria with his mother and his siblings. They managed to escape just before his father was fatally shot in the back. As Ismail was on his way home from school one day, bombs began falling around him as men with rifles stormed through the streets of Homs, Syria. My son was saved by shopkeeper who took him in until the fighting moved on. It was a horrible time and I was in constant fear for my children's lives. I knew we had to get out of Syria. 
Ismail's father arranged for a driver to take Ismail, his mother, and his two siblings into Lebanon. Before he could join them, he was shot in the back and killed. We had a good life. Then the civil war happened and everything was taken from us. Now I have to raise my children alone and try to start over. Ismail's family now lives in a massive camp in the Bekaa Valley with thousands of other refugees. His mother told me she works long hours in a nearby field, making less than $4 a day. Many days as she worked, she thought about how Ismail was being mistreated at the local public school. The teachers hit the children. After everything Ismail had been through, the teachers made it so hard for him that he didn't want to go to the school ever again. Then Heart for Lebanon, which is supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise, invited Ismail to our Hope Center, a school dedicated to providing a safe and loving environment for refugee children. At my old school, the teachers would hit me if I couldn't answer questions right, and all the kids bullied each other. But it's so nice here. I have wonderful friends, and the teachers are really kind. At this openly Christian school, along with learning math, English, and music, students are also shown Superbook in Arabic. Jesus teaches us not to lie and to be good to others. I've learned to be like Him and to pray to God when I'm in trouble. All the children at the school come from Muslim families, but their parents are happy to see what they're learning in this Christian environment. I don't have a problem with my children learning about Jesus and all His teachings, because now there is something different about my children. I can see a change coming from the inside out. They are getting happier every day. Orphans Promise and Heart for Lebanon also provide large portions of food each month to Ismail's family and the other refugees in their camp. I'm so happy to know that there are Christians abroad who are reaching out to Muslims who are suffering and in need. I pray for these people and for God's blessing on them. It means a lot for us to know that they think of us and feel for us. Thank you for the food and for allowing me to go to this school. How do you put a price tag on the gift of hope? Can you imagine being this young mother? Her husband is killed in the war. She is escaping with her children to a country where she doesn't belong. She wasn't there. She's living in a camp where there are no amenities at all and having to work hard in a field for $4 a day and all the time watching her children mistreated. Listen, we want to say thank you for allowing us to step right into the middle of Ismail's need, his mother's need, his family's need. If you're a 700 Club member, you made that happen. And you did it all with 65 cents a day, $20 a month. You know, it doesn't seem like much, but when we all link arms together, we really can make a difference. So thank you for caring. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for your generosity. You are changing the world right from your very own living room. What an opportunity we have to make a difference. If you're not a 700 Club member, go to our toll-free number and call right now, 1-800-700-7000, or you can log on to cbn700clubinteractive.com, uh, and we just welcome you to the family of ministries here. Andrew? It's amazing, you know, watching that story, just the fact that $20 a month from someone yeah. may be not able to accomplish a great deal, but when we're all partnering together, mm -hmm. look at the amazing impact we can have. Yeah. I mean, the, this boy's life has changed, his mother's life has changed, and that's just one little family in that community. It's happening to thousands. And it delights the heart of God. It surely does. It's a wonderful story. We leave you with these words from Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11. For the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. Thanks again so much for joining us today. And if you need prayer, you can always call us at 800-700-7000. We'd love to pray for you. And for Terry Muse and I'm Andrew Knox. We'll see you next time on 700 Club Interactive.